Good morning, everybody, and welcome to the um, Education and Skills Committee. Uh, it's the second meeting of our committee in 2019. I remind everyone to turn their mobile phones and other devices to silent during the meeting. Agenda item one is the decision on taking business in private and ask our members' consent to take agenda items three and four in private. Thank you. And agenda item two is the draft budget. Um, for 2018-2019 and today we'll hear from the Cabinet Secretary for Education and Skills and Government Officials and I welcome to committee John Swinney, Cabinet Secretary for Education and Skills, Eileen McKechnie, Director for Advanced Learning and Science and Andrew Bruce, Deputy Director of Learning Director at the Scottish Government. Very warm welcome to committee and I understand uh, Cabinet Secretary you have an opening statement for us. Uh, Thank you, Kavira, for the opportunity to attend committee today and to provide some opening remarks on the 2019-20 draft budget. As the Finance Secretary explained in his budget statement, our spending plans for 2019-20 are set against a backdrop of the UK Government's continuing austerity and a real risk of the UK exiting the European Union without the necessary safeguards to secure the workforce and programmes that we need for the continued success of our nation. In the budget proposals, education remains a top priority for this Government. Our ambition is to break the intergenerational cycle of deprivation and close the attainment gap to change lives and to change lives for the better. The draft budget delivers £3.4 billion in funding to deliver on our commitments in early learning and childcare and across the education and skills system. Working with and through local government, we will provide almost £500 million to expand early learning and childcare by supporting the recruitment and training of staff and investing in the building refurbishment and extension of about 750 nurseries and family centres. We will invest more than £180 million to raise attainment in schools and close the attainment gap. That includes £120 million that will go directly to head teachers through the Pupil Equity Fund. We will continue to drive our ambitious education reforms with £4 million allocated to empower teachers, parents and communities to deliver excellence and, and e equity in Scottish education. In line with the Committee's views on Education Scotland, we will increase its budget by £2.5 million to enable it to support the reform agenda. We will continue to protect the principle of free education uh, and widening access to university for people from the most deprived communities to ensure that access to university is based on the ability to learn, not the ability to pay. We will continue to invest over £1 billion in our universities, which recognises the importance of teaching and learning and of our world-class research and innovation systems. We will intensify the promotion of Scotland's research excellence and international outlook around the world. And we will continue to invest over £600 million in colleges, helping them to improve the life chances for our citizens and generate the skilled workforce needed for economic growth. Um, we have increased investment to provide additional funding to support harmonisation of pay in terms and conditions across that sector. Skills Development Scotland will receive £214 million, which includes an additional £22 million in the coming financial year to continue the expansion of our apprenticeship programme as we progress towards the delivery of our target of 30,000 starts by 2020. The success and diversification of our apprenticeship programme has demonstrated the different routes young people can take in developing the learning and skills they need to be successful in the workforce. With the development of graduate and foundation apprenticeships, more and more young people have access to widening opportunities and routes to successful future careers. Finally, Kavira, following my statement to Parliament in October last year, we have made provision for redress for survivors of abuse and care. This includes making advance payments to those who may not live long enough to apply to a statutory scheme. The draft budget makes provision for such advance payments, but it must be clearly understood that these payments can only be made if the Budget Bill is passed by Parliament and the necessary parliamentary authority for that expenditure obtained. I look forward to addressing the Committee's questions this morning. Thank you very much, Cabinet Secretary. I'm going to go straight to questions from the Committee and invite Liz Smith. Uh, thank you, uh, Convener. Uh, good morning, Cabinet Secretary. Um, when uh, responding to the budget proposals, um, Professor Andrea Nolan, on behalf of Universities Scotland, said, and I quote, it is very difficult to learn that funding for universities is going to drop in real terms by 1.79%, which reverses the trend of what she described as a slow climb back to sustainable funding from previous years. Uh, Cabinet Secretary, given what you said about the priority in the government's programme for education, 
and obviously the uh, desire to widen access and to ensure that universities remain uh, wholly competitive. Could you explain to the committee why you took that decision to uh, reduce that uh, real terms funding? Well, I think the decision I took was to sustain the funding of the university sector at the level that we had uh, increased it to uh, in the last financial year. And obviously there are many, many competing demands for government expenditure across a whole range of different areas. And I've cited in my opening statement a number of areas within the education portfolio where we have allocated additional resources to expand provision and to put in place uh, additional resources. Uh, obviously, government investment in the university sector is only one part of the investment income of universities. Um, Scottish government investment represents around about 40% of total university income. Uh, so the contribution that we have made and the commitment that has been secured by sustaining the funding that I increased uh, university funding to last year, uh, I think is a strong foundation for the university sector to continue to make the contribution it makes to uh, the uh, wider achievement uh, of individuals in Scotland. Um, could I just pick you up on this uh, wider uh, achievement in maintaining the uh, excellence amongst our uh, university sector, which we've been able to enjoy for a long period of time. Um, I don't think it's any secret that the university sector in Scotland is very concerned about this uh, real terms uh, cut in funding um, for the very simple reason that there are some statistics um, that are pointing of an international level that uh, when it comes to a clear pattern between the levels of resource uh, available to university sectors and their performance, there is a worry uh, that if we do not have the same uh, sustainable level of funding, that Scotland will not be in a position to maintain that uh, excellence that we have been able to enjoy, and particularly when it comes to the competitive advantage in, in research funding. Would you be able to comment uh, on the statistics um, that point to these international concerns, uh, uh, particularly the fact that some of this, that there are signs that within some of the Scottish universities uh, there may be a falling down, just n nothing drastic, but they are falling down some of these uh, world rankings. Well, there's a number, number of points in there that I would address. On, on the, uh, the issue in relation to um, international rankings, I, I think it would be fair to say that there is, um, there will be volatility in performance of individual institutions on a year-by-year -year basis. And I think it's important to look at trends over a period of time. The trends over a period of time, I think, demonstrate the continued and sustained success and profile of a number of leading institutions in Scotland um, in terms of the consistency of their performance over time, notwithstanding volatility in individual years. But then also the consistency of the prominence of their position within those international rankings. And I think we have to look at that more comprehensively. The second point I would make is to reiterate a, a comment I made earlier on, which is that, um, yes, government funding is important, and I acknowledge that. But for the university sector, it's not the only source of income that they have. And um, the, the, the latest data I have available to me shows that um, government funding represents around about 40% of university income. And I think, obviously, uh, universities, you know, when I look at what our universities are able to attract in terms of investment based on the foundations that government contributes, I, I wouldn't say that the government creates all the foundations. That, of course, is a product of the, the excellence within the universities. But we're, we're essentially creating financial strength and capability that enables um, institutions to attract further um, investment income. And then, of course, there are other sources of income that come uh, from other parts of government, notwithstanding the, 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 the main line, which I, I know the one that, that Liz Smith comments upon within the, the draft budget and the education skills portfolio, but there is other income that goes to universities through, for example, the health service and a variety of other streams. And I suppose, lastly, uh, I, I would say that you know, within the university sector, I think you know, the, the, I'm aware of the comments that Professor Nolan has made. Um, equally, I'm aware of comments that uh, Professor Muscatelli has made, who said that, um, and I quote, even in tough times, the Scottish Government is continuing to strongly support our universities 
with substantial investment of over £1 billion in the draft budget. Um, this core budget allows our HE sector to continue to punch well above our weight, leverage additional economic benefits for Scotland. So I think there's a, you know, I am absolutely committed to an engaged discussion with the university sector to make sure that we are able to support their aspirations. We share the aspirations. I think when we look at the, um, the economic strategy that Mr Mackay has taken forward, the universities are key participants within that and the work Mr Lockhead and I are taking forward with the university sector is designed to make sure that the university sector is able to make a significant contribution through much greater partnerships with the business community in Scotland, uh, which I welcome and which I think are happening, uh, and much more involvement, more close involvement in the international projection of Scotland. And from my recent trip to India, which I undertook with a number of universities, um, I was um, thrilled by the strength of proposition that the universities were able to offer in partnership with business uh, that were part of that trip. Do you share the concern, Cabinet Secretary, that when it comes to uh, ensuring that we are broadening the appeal of Scottish universities, uh, particularly when it comes to research funding and particularly when it comes to attracting the best students and staff, and there are obvious challenges there because of uh, Brexit, but do you accept that one of the concerns that the university sector has is that the real terms cut uh, this projection just now makes that much more difficult when there are ambitions to widen access, which uh, has an obvious impact on the number of places that are available, and when uh, when it comes to the financial transactions, there are, there is obviously an increasing um, sort of tendency to have loans rather than government spending within that category. Do you accept that there is a real concern about just how sustainable uh, the projected budget actually is for the sector, given the ambitions which you uh, espoused earlier? I, I, I don't have those concerns for two reasons. The first is that is to reiterate the point that government, uh, uh, government investment represents uh, a minority of university income across the sectors. So obviously the universities are very successful in attracting other income. Um, so I, I, I don't have that concern, um, given the higher platform that we're operating from, given the increase in the budget last year. The second point is that um, when it comes to uh, instruments like financial transactions, um, these are part of the, um, the financial framework of the United Kingdom. The government in Scotland has to utilise those financial transactions in some way but we are restricted in how we can use those. You know, we cannot just distribute them like capital grant. We can't just give them to, um, I'm going to say we can't allocate them to local authorities, and I don't think we can ordinarily uh, because they have to be, um, yeah, with a, I think that's correct, that they have to be allocated to essentially um, third party organisations that are not part of government. So we've got limited places where we can allocate those financial transactions. And what the university sector is able to do is to actually use those to leverage other income because they are essentially third parties in public sector terms. So I think there's opportunities for, and, and when you look at the round, in the round between financial transactions and capital and resource, um, the resources available to the university sector, um, the higher education sector is increasing. The final point I'd make on this, uh, and, uh, is, is, and Liz Smith raised the issue of, um, of the challenges that are thrown up by Brexit, and I think the challenges are, um, uh, you know, and, I'm, and I'm, I'm not making a partisan point here, I, I'm deeply concerned about where we are going on freedom of movement, because our university sector in my lifetime, if I look at the University of Edinburgh, which I had the privilege to attend as a student um, over 35 years ago, um, the University of Edinburgh today is a completely different institution to the one I attended 35 years ago. In its international breadth, its reach, it is, a, it, is a, it is an institution that draws together people from all manner of backgrounds in, stu in studying and also in research. And I am deeply concerned that to me is the biggest strategic threat our universities face is about freedom of movement of individuals um, because 
our universities need to be able to attract international talent, not just as students, but as researchers and academics. And I'm very concerned about where we are positioned on that question. And I view that as the biggest strategic threat our universities face. Uh, thank you. My, just my final question, I don't disagree, uh, Cabinet Secretary, with what you've just said. Uh, on, on that similar theme, would you be able to give a commitment uh, today that the uh, money that is currently used um, from Scottish Government funds to um, support EU students, would you be able to give a guarantee that that money um, should we um, exit the EU, and particularly if it was a, a, a no deal situation, would you be able to give a guarantee that that money would remain in the university sector? I think I, I, think I better get my ducks in, in a row before I answer this question. The first thing to say is that I, I hope we don't leave the European Union. And after yesterday's events, I think the possibility of us avoiding leaving the European Union is now higher. And uh, so in one respect, I'm more optimistic. But then my next duck in a row is that the dangers of New no Deal have made a, a, a resurgence, which, which is why the events of today and the next few days are critical in trying to navigate a way to avoid uh, a, new, a No Deal situation and to ensure that we get to my preferred outcome, which is our continued membership of the European Union. Um, obviously, what so there's a, a couple of pretty big questions there before I get on to addressing the, the, the very real question that Liz Smith puts to me. Um, I can't give that commitment today because it's a, it's a future financial year. We have obviously given sustained commitments to the university sector in relation to the support for EU students. And uh, obviously I will engage very closely with the university sector on that key question uh, as we proceed. And obviously it's a material point for the finance secretary to consider in future budgets. Thank you. Okay, yeah, Mr. Gray. Um, you've made clear that you have uh, confidence in the sustainability of the funding of our university sector going forward. But um, Alistair Sim, who's the director of University Scotland, in his uh, letter to the committee says, we've seen Scotland's number of universities in the top 200 drop from five to four. We need sustainable investment if we're going to keep Scotland's critical advantage as a place to study, research and do business. So he clearly doesn't share your confidence in the sustainability of funding going forward. Why do you think he's wrong? I, I, I think there will obviously be um, you know, points of debate here. I, I've cited my answer to Liz Smith, Professor Muscatelli, who uh, obviously takes a very different view to the view expressed by uh, Alistair Sim and by Professor Nolan. Um, but what I would say uh, is really to reiterate a couple of points that I made to Liz Smith. We have um, government funding, whilst important, represents a minority of university income in total. Um, uh, the, the, the number is between 37 and 40%. Um, and secondly, um, the, the government increased the resources available to universities in, res uh, in the resource budget last year, and we have been able to sustain that this year in resource terms. That's not true in real terms, is it? They've well, fallen I, I, again in real terms. Well, I, I, in, in, in resource real terms, yes, that is the case. But when we put together, um, and if I... If we put together um, the resource capital and financial transactions, it represents an increase in the higher education budget of £12.1 million over the budget in 2018-19. So as a combined um, budget allocation to the higher education sector, um, the resources are £12.1 million higher between those two years. So um, I think that higher platform and that increased global set of resources, and again, I reiterate my point I made to, to Liz Smith about financial transactions, these are valuable mechanisms through which universities can then leverage additional income into universities. Um, and, and as a government, we have limited destinations for that type of funding. Uh, I think as a package, it represents a strong foundation for the sector. Well, while we're uh, talking about uh, additional income, in their submission, 
University of Scotland identify what they think should be around £18 million pounds of Barnet consequentials um, as a result of increased research spending uh, in the UK. Um, and I wonder if you could give a commitment that those consequentials would be used for that purpose in Scotland, as we've seen, for example, in NHS consequentials where that commitment was given. On, on that point, um, I think Mr Gray is familiar with the government's uh, position. Indeed, I think it's been the position of, of all governments in, um, since devolution that Barnet consequentials come into our budget, with the exception of the health service, um, to be allocated across a range of, of public expenditure areas by the finance secretary. Now, obviously, I know the importance the university sector attaches to this particular grouping of uh, Barnet consequentials. I can assure the committee that um, these issues and perspectives will be fully considered by the government as we take decisions uh, on any such consequentials. As you say, uh, an exception to that rule is made with the NHS, given the importance of research to the economy and confidence in the sector and its competitiveness, isn't it? Was, uh, 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 well, an area well, where you could make a similar commitment? Well, yes, I, I understand the significance of it, and that's why I make the point that the university sector has such a contribution to make in partnership with the business community to advancing the innovation agenda. And obviously, these issues will be considered by the government um, as we look at the allocation okay. of any consequences. Could I turn uh, briefly to the college sector? So the position in the college mm -hmm. sector is that there is a real terms increase in uh, revenue funding in the college sector of around 1.3%. But colleges themselves, and I think Mr Swinney, you acknowledged this in your opening remarks, are clear that that increase is entirely to deal with the costs of national bargaining and harmonisation, which flows from that, which was, of course, the implementation of a, a policy which the Scottish Government pursued and which we supported. That means, however, that in the college sector there is no prospect of them finding additional resource for any cost of living increase uh, for their staff, which is why we find ourselves today facing another strike by college lecturers. So perhaps Mr Swinney could explain if the increase the college sector is receiving is to pay for harmonisation how are the college expect, uh, sector expected to pay, even within the terms of public sector pay policy, a cost of living increase to their staff without making cuts elsewhere? Well, well I think the college sector, the college employers have made an offer to members of staff, which is in addition to the harmonisation of contracts that the government has fully funded. So, there is an, so the, the point that Mr, Mr Gray's question infers that there is no offer on the table from the college employers to members of staff because there isn't any money available, but the employers have made a, a, an offer uh, to the, um, the trade unions for 2017-18, 18-19 and 19-20, which is in addition to the harmonisation, which Mr Gray is absolutely correct, uh, the government has properly and fully funded. So um, the resources clearly are there to afford uh, a cost of living increase because the employers have offered that. Well, if the increase in resource is to cover harmonisation, if the resources are there, they're going to have to come out of some other aspect of activity the sector undertakes. Is that not the case? But, but you know, the sector will be making... Um, financial choices on a constant basis. Every public organisation makes financial choices. Do you mean cuts? No, but choices about how to allocate money in particular areas. And um, the, the uh, college sector finds itself in a position able to harmonise the contracts of further education lectures across the country, which I'm very pleased the government has been able to secure as a policy objective and which is now being implemented over a, a three-year period. Um, fully funded by the Scottish Government. And then, in addition to that, uh, the college employers are able to make um, a, a cost of living increase 
uh, available to members of staff uh, into the bargain. Isn't it both for these members of staff to expect a cost of living pay increase over and above the harmonisation change similar to uh, other workers in the public sector? Uh, I think is that a reasonable objective? I think a reasonable objective is to secure a cost of living increase that's affordable within the sector. But and and I don't think it's I don't think it's reasonable to discount the effect of pay harmonisation in the process. No, I don't. So, so you think that a cost of living pay increase for these staff should be reduced on the basis that some have benefited from the, the entirely separate national bargaining policy? I, I, I think it's. I, I don't think it is defensible to separate harmonisation and cost of living as two separate things. Okay, thanks. Um, I was just going to ask one or two questions about um, additional support needs uh, in schools, if I may. Um, it was really just to find out, when it comes to that, what the benchmark is for success, in your view, when it comes to the monies that are being allocated in that area in the budget. How, how do you intend to, to measure whether that's a successful input? Um, what, we, what we want to make sure is that the... Um, the additional support needs of young people are met so that they can then progress on to the achievement of positive destinations. And uh, that, that essentially is the framework that uh, we put in place. Um, the, we look very carefully at the progression of young people through um, uh, their education. Uh, we look at the points they reach in terms of uh, achievement of qualifications, um, the recording of particular achievements, and then their progress on to positive destinations. And the duty then is on individual local authorities to make sure they put in place the arrangements and the support that will enable young people to make, um, to, to, to make that journey. Thank you, Cabinet Secretary. And are you, are you satisfied that the, the data that you have available is, is is consistently gathered, as it were, over different local authorities, or is that is that robust in your view? I think we are getting to a position where that um, the data and additional support needs is getting more consistent across the country. Um, the in relation to in the changes that were made in two thousand and ten to the collection of data around additional support needs led to um, a much more significant identification of the prevalence of additional support needs within our education system uh, amongst young people. And uh, that has given us a more comprehensive picture ar around the country. There still is within that a degree of variation local authority by local authority, and that's why I, th I say I think we are making, we are making progress in that direction. Equally, I think um, some of the, um, the recording of information on um, availability of staff, uh, which I know has been the subject of correspondence with the committee, and indeed I've responded to some of the committee's inquiries on this point, um, is an attempt to try to get to more consistently available information in that respect. Um, so I, th I think the, uh, the data is improving to help us in that direction. Thank you, Convener. Thank you, um, Mr. Greer. Thank you, Convener. Um, to stick with the theme question from Dr. Allen on positive destinations for, for young people with additional needs, the range of additional needs that we identify in Scotland is, is considerable. Does the government consider disaggregating the, the data there on the um, percentage of young people with additional needs are reaching a, a positive destination. There's an issue with when you're using a, a single generalised measurement for a large group of young people whose additional uh, needs are, are vast, that you're missing important pictures within that, that there are particular additional needs that young people have, that there seems to be an issue with those groups not reaching the uh, positive destinations in the same number as others. There's obviously a significant difference between those who are um, autistic potentially to the point of being non-verbal and those with a, a mild emotional or, or behavioural challenge. I think, uh, I think it's, a, it's a very fair point um, that we, we are looking at, we're looking at broad ranges of data um, 
around additional support needs. The, the, the latest um, data that we have is that the 87 per cent of school leavers with additional support needs had a positive uh, follow-up destination in 2016-17. That was a 5.1 percentage point increase uh, since 2011-12. But within that, there will be um, uh, particular young people with particular needs who will have been able to um, to achieve more with particular support than in other circumstances. I think we have to remain very open to identifying how we can best uh, meet the needs of those young people. And that, a lot of that thinking, I, for me, comes back to the steps that we take through the agenda of getting it right for every child, whereby we, we try to identify what are the particular requirements of individual young people and how can we support them to fulfil their potential as best as we possibly can do. And if there are refinements to the data set that are required to help us to do that, I, I'm certainly very open to considering how that might be undertaken. That would be helpful. Um, but just for clarification, at present, does the government do any work to disaggregate that data, that, that overall measurement of the percentage of young people with additional needs uh, who are achieving a positive destination? Is there any breakdown of that by need category? I doubt, I doubt it, but I think I better just reserve my position to write to the committee to, if, if that's not correct. But I doubt that I doubt we will go down much. Well, let me just see what we've got here. I'm just gonna, well, there's some degree of it, yes. Um, uh, we have um, disaggregation by... Um, uh, let me just see how these are... I, yeah, you, you've, you've got categories that go to, you have one specifically on dyslexia, but there isn't one, for example, on autism, as I have in front of me. Uh, or, uh, oh, there is, my, sorry, I'm trying to miss that there. There is autistic spectrum disorder, um, social, emotional and behavioural difficulty, physical health problems, mental health problems, interrupted learning, English as an additional language, visual impairment, hearing impairment, so yes, this is contained in uh, Table L3.1 um, of the, um, uh, the additional needs data. So there is a, um, a, a level of, and, and, and it's then, uh, the, the data is then spread across initial post positive destinations, higher education, further education, training, employment, voluntary work, activity agreement, unemployed, seeking work, uh, unemployed, uh, not seeking work. So there is a fair amount of... Uh, now, obviously, the categories there may require more disaggregation um, because some of these will uh, involve quite substantial numbers. Um, so, you know, in, in terms of dyslexia, for example, uh, in this particular data set for 2016-17, we're talking about uh, 2,720 learners. Um, so there's, um, you know, there may be further disaggregation that could be undertaken, but uh, I'm happy to share that with the committee. That's useful. Uh, thank you, Cabinet Secretary. Um, overall, do you believe that spending on additional support needs, which, as you've said yourself previously, happens overwhelmingly at a local authority level, is keeping up with identified demand? Um, yes, because I think we've, I think an important to, uh, change has taken place and that important change is that more and more of young people are um, having a broader range of needs I identified which many of which would have been supported and assisted within the mainstream education system um, so I think the you know we, we have the presumption of mainstreaming now um, well embedded within our education system. We have um, more and more of young people with additional support needs having their needs um, supported within that mainstream sector. And then we also have um, the identification of the needs of those young people and the meeting of them, those needs within mainstream uh, education settings predominantly. Um, obviously, there are specific provisions that the government makes to uh, provide special education for some young people with additional support needs, um, but fundamentally, um, those needs um, should be and, and, and must be met within the education system. 
There's a concern that the overall spend on additional support needs, there's certainly an issue of consistency and, and accounting for it. I think um, Spice have previously referred to the way it's accounted for between local authorities as essentially arbitrary. Um, there's a significant concern that the appearance can be given that spending on additional support needs is uh, at the least staying uh, steady, which um, would uh, not be keeping up with demand given that demand has more than doubled. But that this is simply because of, uh, I'm not, uh, interesting accounting uh, along the lines that, that you've indicated that uh, pupils with additional support needs are uh, allegedly having those needs met uh, through mainstream education, through generalised um, spend. But if we take coordinated support plans, for example, the proportion of young people with an identified additional need with a coordinated support plan has fallen. The, the percentage has fallen from around 6% to around um, one percent. I've previously raised this with you in the chamber, and you said you'd be happy to consider the concerns that have been raised with uh, ourselves as a committee that it may have been financial uh, pressures that were causing that. Now, those, uh, if, if that was the case, that obviously would not be meeting the requirements on local authorities under existing legislation. Has the government done any work to investigate why the number of coordinated support plans has changed? Mentally, um, this is a statutory issue for individual local authorities because they, they, have, you know, they have to exercise their functions in relation to the additional support for learning legislation, which puts a responsibility on local authorities to assess and meet the needs of young people. And as I've explained to the committee before, there is, of course, a set of interventions that are available for families concerned about these points, which can ultimately result in tribunal uh, cases about these matters. And I'm, as I, as I, again, as I've said to the committee before, I'm not an advocate for tribunal uh, processes. They're a place of last resort, in my opinion. I'd much rather that there was collaborative dialogue to resolve the issues that are of concern to, to families. Um, but fundamentally, local authorities have to satisfy themselves that they, and, and also um, families, that they are meeting the needs of individual young people. Now, in relation to um, financial support for additional support for learning. On the most recent information that I've got available to me for 2016-17, um, there was an increase in the resources spent by local authorities on additional support for learning um, of 2.3% in real terms in 2016-17. So I think that Per head increase that, that that would per head per child with identified additional needs that would constitute a drop in spending but given the significant that, rise in the number of young people with identified needs. Well, not between. I doubt that between 2015-16 and 2016-17. I would doubt that. Um, I think the, the issue that I was trying to address in my first in my, my previous answer to Mr. Greer was the fact that in 2010 we sig significantly expanded the data collection on additional uh, support needs to cover a whole range of, um, of circumstances that would not merit the formulation of a coordinated support plan. Um, and uh, so therefore, the, the, the type of comparison I'm giving about finances is much more within that territory where there are specific additional financial requirements that need to be met in relation to the delivery of additional support for learning services. And just one final question on coordinated support plans, convener. Um, Cabinet Secretary, I, I accept what you say that the, the, each individual support plan is a matter for the local authority um, in uh, relation with the, the family and the child with additional needs. But there is clearly a, a national pattern here, as I've raised with you previously. Does the government not have a responsibility to look into what appears to be a national pattern of a reduction in the number of coordinated support plans where there's significant feedback coming from parents, coming from families, and coming often from teachers anonymously, that they believe this is because of financial constraints. Surely the government should be looking into why this is the case. Some of these issues are being looked into as part of my dialogue with the, um, uh, the organisations who have raised the concerns through the Not Included report, which was published uh, back in <coughs> September, if my memory says me right. Uh, and obviously, I've um, taken part in <coughs> a parliamentary debate um, on this question, in which I've set out the steps the government's taken to respond to that report. 
And indeed, I will be convening uh, a round table on these questions uh, with many organisations and stakeholders. Um, I think it's, it's sometime in the, the near future. I, I can't remember exactly the date, but it's, um, <clears throat> it's certainly now, um, it's now arranged as part of my dialogue with these organisations to address the concerns that are included um, within the, the, the not included in the education report, which has been subject uh, to consideration by Parliament and also by the committee. I understand why you've delayed the publication of the government's research based on that report's publication. Do you now have uh, an indicative timescale in which you intend to publish your research in conjunction with a response to, to that report? I, I'd, like to, I'd like to move at, at pace on this. And as I say, I just can't recall when the, the, the round table session is, but I've, I've had a meeting already with the, uh, the autism organisations and I want to take forward that uh, that round table discussion. Um, I want to do it as quickly as I possibly can do, but I hope the committee appreciates that I'm trying to do this in a holistic fashion that brings together the research and the actions that flow from this. If I feel that the time scale is taking a bit too long, then I will move to publish the research evidence uh, at an earlier stage. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Mr Scott? <coughs> Excuse me. Thank you very much. Um, I wonder if... Uh, uh, Cabinet Secretary, if you could set out the advantages to the government uh, for uh, using ring fencing as a mechanism, for example, on the Pupil Equity Fund. Well, the, the, the I think um, Pupil Equity Funding is, um, well, the purpose of Pupil Equity Funding is to put uh, resources into the hands of individual schools to make decisions about how in their judgment, they can best meet the needs of individual pupils to close the poverty-related attainment gap. Now, I, I would judge that to be um, a different type of financial arrangement because from what we would consider to be traditional ring fencing, because we are putting, we've taken a deliberate policy decision to put those resources in the hands of individual schools to enable more focused spending on individual pupils and their needs. Um, but also to empower schools with greater discretion in the utilisation of resources. On more traditional ring fencing, if that's also part of the question that Mr Scott raises with me, um, there will be occasions where the government um, has a policy priority that it wishes to advance and therefore enters into uh, what we would call a traditional ring fencing arrangement, but that represents a very small proportion now of local authority expenditure. I was just looking at the, the um, briefing for today's meeting from, uh, from our uh, uh, SPICE services, and, it's, and they report that there's a, the £120 million pounds for pupil equity funding, there's £4.5 million, pounds, I'd appreciate it's a small amount of money in the context of the overall budget, as you've said, £4.5 million pounds on Gaelic um, and £262.2 .2 million for early years and childcare, and then there's some capital on that as well. But those are all, as SPICE describe it, as, as uh, grant funding that is ring-fenced. Is that, is that fair? I suppose. It, I suppose. It, it, I think it probably is fair. Um, I think, although I would, I would make a distinction, which I was trying to do in my other answer between pupil equity funding and other ring fenced grants, because pupil equity funding is going to a different set of decision makers. It's not going into local, what I would call traditional local authority ring fencing arrangements. But it is ring fenced for the purpose of closing the attainment gap. But it is. It is. The decisions are taken by schools, not by local authorities. Could you just clarify the difference? I mean, I appreciate this is deathly dull in some ways, but the, the difference between this and the Attainment Scotland Fund, which I think is described as targeted funding, if again, if I read my briefing correctly. With, with the Attainment Scotland funding, uh, I suppose there's also a difference of, of time scale. The Attainment Scotland activity started earlier than pupil equity funding, and the Attainment Scotland funding has two elements about it. One is essentially um, a, a programme that involves local authorities and then a programme that involves individual schools. So the, um, the, the work with local authorities is about working with a number of local authorities who, in whose areas we have the greatest challenges in relation to the attainment gap to support them in, in the, the collective activity that is required to close the attainment gap. And then through the second part of the Attainment Scotland Fund to focus expenditure on individual schools where there is a real prevalence of the attainment gap. What pupil equity funding then does 
is take some of the rationale of the schools programme and spread that more widely to represent, re recognise the fact that um, poverty um, doesn't just pr present itself in big groupings, which the attainment fund generally recognises. Poverty presents itself in a range of different areas around the country. And as a consequence, about 95% of the schools receive some allocation from pupil equity funding. That's fair. On the attainment Scotland fund, nine local authorities receive funding under that? Forgive me. Nine local authorities uh, receive yes, funding nine, under that? Yes, nine, nine, nine yes. Um, have you, I mean, we've discussed this before, but have you given any more thought to that, to, to the very point you make about the poverty indices, the mechanism by which you collate data that therefore leads to that allocation of funding? There is work going on within our analytical community to try to, to, to devise uh, more fine-grained mechanisms that would enable us to recognise uh, uh, poverty. So that, that work is, is ongoing just now. Um, we're talking to, uh, to individual local authorities who have particular thoughts on that question. And we're also discussing it with the analytical community. Because uh, as I think I've gone through with the committee before, um, we have used what is the, 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 the mechanism that provides what I would call the longest reach into the country through uh, eligibility for free school meals. Whereas um, if we used one of the other core identifiers of the Scottish Index of Multiple Deprivation, we wouldn't be reaching as far into the country as we are reaching with PEF. And therefore, by next year's budget, would you assume that uh, there may be a change to this mechanism for allocation in this area? I, of a number of years well, now, would the work, the work, I, I certainly would want the work to be completed. Yeah. Whether, whether it will lead us to a different mechanism is a, is, a, is a different question, but I would want to have that, uh, that completed. I'm happy to update the committee on the yeah. progress that we make in that respect. Thank you. Okay, thank you, uh, Ms Mackay. Thank you, Convener. Good morning, Cabinet Secretary. Um, the government's making a huge investment in early uh, years and, and childcare. Um, can you clarify how local authorities will be held accountable um, to ensure that the, the funding is, uh, to support this expansion has been used, um, has been spent for this purpose, and has been shared appropriately with between public and private providers? Um, the, essentially, we have um, we, we have a, a, an implementation board that looks at the. Uh, delivery of early learning and the early learning and childcare expansion around the country. And that's a board jointly chaired by Marie Todd as the Minister for uh, Children and Young People and Councillor Stephen McCabe, uh, the COSLA <coughs> Education Spokesperson. And that grouping is designed to essentially monitor the progress that is made against the plans that were submitted by local authorities. Now, in those plans, um, individual local so that, that 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 body will look at the progress that is made and to be satisfied that sufficient progress is is actually being achieved within those individual plans of local authorities um, there were expectations set out and funded by on an agreed basis between the convention of Scottish local authorities and the government about the mix of um, private and uh, public provision that would be envisaged within early learning and childcare. And obviously we'll be monitoring the progress that is made against those um, expectations uh, as we implement the programme. Thank you. So I think there's been a, quite a, a, a variety of um, different practice between the local authorities. So it's yeah, well, we, have to, we have to make sure um, two things are happening. One, that sufficient progress is being made on the delivery of early learning and childcare over the period to full rollout in August 2020. And secondly, that uh, we are able to see that the expectations that individual local authorities signed up to about the balance and the nature of the delivery would actually be reflected in uh, what happens on the ground. And we're looking at that very closely because I'm aware of the concerns that have been expressed in different parts of the country about whether or not the private sector is securing quite as much um, of a role in this expansion that uh, they may have considered uh, they should be able to get. Thank you. 
Um, can you explain the process by which the, the new multi-year funding agreement between the government and COSLA was agreed and how the yearly amounts were determined? What happened here was that we, each local authority was invited to prepare a plan in relation to its resource and capital requirements to achieve full rollout by August 2020. Individual local authorities produced those plans and then we went through a process of, of discussion and dialogue between the government and local authorities with the support of the Scottish Futures Trust in, uh, in testing those, um, those approaches that, that were being taken forward. At the end of that process, we essentially got to um, a set of plans which had originated from local authorities, been tested in dialogue with the government, which we all agreed, and that then, and from that, was constructed the amount of money that was required to, uh, to implement the policy proposal, and obviously that is phased over a number of years because we're, we're building up to August 2020 at different paces and different stages around the country. Um, that, um, we, we then left it, once we'd agreed that global sum, we then left the question to local authorities as to whether that would be, that funding would be distributed by um, the, 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 the habitual um, distribution formula that is used within local government or whether it would be distributed on a needs basis, essentially on the basis of what each individual local authority had said they needed to, to deliver. Now, there are obviously differences between those two numbers. Um, so for some local authorities, um, they, may they may have, um, they may have um, the, the, the the plan may have, for example, said they needed five million pounds, but the distribution formula might have given them four million pounds. And so local government took the decision itself that it would allocate on the basis of need, uh, as opposed to by the distribution formula, which is, um, in my experience, a, 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 a more of an exceptional decision for local authorities to take than to use the distribution formula. Uh, but that was done because the, the, the local government took the view that <coughs> the estimates had been constructed authority by authority, so they should be paid authority by authority. There are, of course, um, uh, mechanisms in place for an annual review to assess the progress that is being made and the appropriateness of the plans that are put in place by individual authorities. Okay, thank you. Just final... Um, on, on that, that, that sort of point, um, can you confirm that the government will evaluate the expansion and, and if possible, how would you do that um, with regard to child development and increased, you know, parental employment and and, and studying, etc., which was one of the, the aims of the expansion? There's, there's, there's monitoring and evaluation in two respects. One is obviously we're looking at the we're in a delivery phase, so we're looking at the implementation of the programme. We're looking at that stage by stage to determine whether sufficient progress has been made in the rollout of the uh, the programme. Um, so th th there's that evaluation that is undertaken. We've also commenced, commenced um, a, a, a essentially an evaluation study which collects baseline data from 600 families around the country of a situation prior to um, the commencement of the programme. And we will work our way through with those families through the... Um, the implementation of this programme until the full findings are available in 2024, which will look at the experience in relation to the development of, uh, of children, uh, which will look at their um, preparedness for formal education. It will look at their progress in relation to the early level and it will also look at impacts on families in relation to some of the wider questions about employment uh, and other factors that uh, Ms Mackay raised with me. Um, I think what I would say anecdotally in relation to Erlen and Chalky, I think this has been the, ex the, the interesting experience in this school year, is that, uh, or this academic year I should say, um, is that we are seeing pupils coming into primary one who have had the benefit 
of at least one year of 1140 hours. And anecdotally, my dialogue with primary one teachers tells me that young people are really coming into school very significantly strengthened by their experience of 1140 hours. And uh, obviously, the, <coughs> the, <coughs> the evaluation study will tell us uh, in more detail and with more scientific analysis of the benefit this has had for young people and for families. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Could I just ask a supplementary on that, um, uh, Cabinet Secretary? Um, so I have heard about some of the, the issues around um, whether childminders have been included in the delivery models and trials that have been put forward. But what does the, the funding follow the child model and the principle behind that mean for parents in terms of flexibility going forward? Um, I, I certainly... Our, our advice and our guidance is very clear that childminders should be very much part of the process and we, uh, those aspirations are shared with local government and signed up to um, with, with local government but it's very much a local authority led dialogue that is taking place and what ministers have made clear is that if there are concerns in different parts of the country about how this dialogue is taking forward we would want to hear that so we can raise that and, and pursue it. But certainly, I would want that to be the case. And under the funding follows the child model, what we are trying to do is to maximise flexibility for parents to, to meet their needs, which is why we need to have a mixed economy of um, a public sector provision, private provision and childminding provision to make sure that we can actually meet the, the needs of families by providing high quality support to children in different settings and to ensure that the, um, the arrangements for supporting children are as seamless as possible uh, to, uh, for, the, for the benefit of children, but then also to try to deliver flexibility for parents. Thank you, Cabinet Secretary. Can I move to Jenny Goldrith? Uh, good morning, Cabinet Secretary, and to the panel. Um, I'd like to go back to Tavish Scott's line of questioning, uh, specifically with regard to the Pupil Equity Funds, and appreciate the Cabinet Secretary had written to the committee in advance of today's meeting. So, with regard to that underspent, um, I think 40% of Pupil Equity funding was underspent last year, last school year, um, and it was reported in the Times Educational Supplement that that amounted to almost £50 million. Pounds. So East and Bartonshire spent the most by local authority. I think 82% was spent there. But some schools didn't spend any. So Canusi High was, was cited as an example of a school that didn't spend any of its PEF money. And in your letter, you say that the PEF fund was introduced, obviously, at the start of the financial year, so two-thirds through the school year. But I wonder if the government's identified any specific problems locally at a local authority level, because there do seem to be these regional variations about who's spending what and at which times, and who's able to essentially use the money. I think the, 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 the I think the first year um, is a bit of an exception for the circumstances that I narrated in my uh, earlier letter to the convener, and I certainly wouldn't expect, and we are not envisaging in our financial management of the year to see a, 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 a particularly significant underspend on pupil equity funding. There may be some underspend, um, but because obviously we have got uh, the ability, uh, schools will not lose any ability to spend as a consequence of, um, of uh, not proceeding uh, swiftly in this respect, but uh, they will retain their full spending power, but we would imagine that is a much lower level of underspend um, later on. I think the, <coughs> in relation to the, 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 the other point that Ms. Garuth raises with me, I think the, what we're seeing, I think, is a very good level of participation in pupil equity funding around the country. I think the arrangements are now becoming much more embedded. I think some of the early um, tension, if I might use that word, between schools and local authorities has settled down. And I think there's now a much better approach to how the decision making is undertaken. Obviously, some schools have opted for um, long-term programmes. They've taken, they've, they've, they've heard <coughs> the financial certainty the government has given around pupil equity funding for the remainder of this parliamentary term and have taken decisions which um, essentially lock in their 
uh, their, their spending plans for the duration of this programme because they judge those to be the most sustained interventions that they would require to make. Other schools will have judged that they could that they may change some of their plans in the duration of this parliamentary term. So I think the the, the, the general pattern of plan formulation and implementation, I think, is now uh, proving to be pretty robust around the country. Uh, we will have an experience where some of the work that is undertaken is not successful, and that we've got to accept that and live with that fact and understand from it why it's not been successful. But I think we're also beginning to see, and I think I'm hearing this at a discussion um, a few weeks ago um, with the, it's just before Christmas, actually, with um, all of our inspectors. And uh, we were discussing how um, what they are seeing in relation to the pattern of activity around the utilisation of pupil equity funding. And I took a great deal of encouragement from that dialogue that they are seeing um, emerging evidence of interventions that are very successful, that are worthy of being shared across the education system so that we can identify what are the core propositions that will make a difference in closing the attainment gap. Okay, thank you. Um, your letter also points to an increase of nearly 300 teaching posts uh, through, I think, primarily the Attainment Scotland Fund, of which most has come from, from PEF. Um, and obviously the Cabinet Secretary will be aware that when advertising these posts, some local authorities, including Fife, siphon off a percentage for HR administration purposes. And I wonder, therefore, has the government looked at how this is done uh, at local level to ensure there's a greater consistency of how much of that fund has been taken by local authorities to advertise teaching posts, for example? Um, we are looking at um, these questions. I I'd have to say that I I'm, you know, and it comes back to part of my earlier answer, I think we're seeing a situation where the the, 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 there is a, a, a good and productive climate between local authorities and schools in, um, in taking forward many of these questions. Um, I think at an individual school level, I, 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 I hear from schools they don't want to be encumbered with all sorts of processes that they're not habitually organised to do, and if the local authority can del deliver that for them in a seamless way, then that's a helpful, and I, I completely accept that argument. Um, and, and I don't, um, I don't detect um, much difficulty for schools in being able to make the choices they want to make about the spending of these resources. Um, and I, I think that's an evidence of a collaborative education system uh, enabling schools to take these decisions on an empowered basis uh, with local authorities providing support where it makes rational sense for local authorities to provide that support. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Um, Mr. Bundell. Thank you, uh, Convener. Just uh, following on uh, from those questions, what uh, percentage of underspend would you expect to see? Have you done any sort of analysis of, of, of what you're expecting next year, for example? Um, I, I can't give Mr. Mundell a specific figure at this stage, but um, uh, I do expect it to be significantly lower than uh, the 40%. Because uh, I, I then look at uh, the Attainment Scotland Fund. Uh, figures that, that we have, um, and there's still an 18% underspend there in 2017-18, and that's excluding PEF. Is that, is that uh, a, a, bit, a bit of a cumulative carry forward from it's essentially the same issues of it takes a while to get expenditure out of the door when a programme starts, and it's, it's essentially um, a cumulative impact of that slower start, which is still working through the system. But what, I've, what the government has said is that we will spend £750 million on this programme, and that's, that's, that's what we will do. So does that mean schools can be confident that it's a multi-year roll forward and it will yes. keep going indefinitely until it's spent or until the end of this? Well, so. what, um, it, it will continue um, until the £750 million is spent, yes. So schools, schools can be confident that with the line of sight of that financial allocation, yes. Okay, and uh, just uh, for clarity, I mean, who holds on to who holds on to that money while it's not being spent? Um, where does that sit? It, I, I don't. It will either sit with the government, or it may sit with local authorities. Uh, I'd have to give. I, I, I suspect it probably 
is distributed to local authorities. It is distributed to local authorities, isn't it? Yes. Yeah, PEF is. Yeah. Uh, PEF is distributed through local authorities, so any underspend will sit with local authorities but then be accessible by schools. An attainment challenge underspend will sit with the government and then allocated through that mechanism. So um, that leads me on to my, my next question was just whether there had been um, any progress in looking at expanding uh, the, the fund further or <coughs> um, just, just looking at how it's distributed um, in terms of small uh, rural schools. And my question really is if, if, if there is a sort of fairly significant uh, underspend and that's going to continue in, in terms of a time lag, you know, whether or not any money can be, be found for those 4% of schools, you know, many of whom are facing uh, serious challenges, you know, and again, who have not had these opportunities that have been afforded to most other schools. I think the, the, the answer to, 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 to that is in two parts. One is in relation to the points that I, I explained to Mr Scott in his question about distribution mechanisms, where um, you know, the point that Mr Mundell raises is a fair point about uh, small rural schools where it is perhaps um, more difficult to identify instances of poverty that have driven our distribution in this area. And, you know, I'm keen to conclude that issue as, as quickly as I possibly can do. Um, but then the second point is that there really isn't an available underspend, if I could use that terminology here, because of the answer I gave Mr Mundell a moment ago, which is that the resources are spoken for, they are allocated to individual schools or to local authorities. And the fact that they've not been spent doesn't mean that the commitment to those schools evaporates. That remains in place. Um, so it would be we would need to find additional resources to supplement the programme if that was what we were going to do. Thank you. Uh, thank you. And then my next question again was just that's probably my final question, just on uh, the, the the differences between local authorities. I mean, I looked down uh, some of the figures and you know. It, it, I, I wouldn't say there was a, a definite trend, but uh, do you accept there's a possibility that it is more difficult for rural local authorities or schools in, in, in more rural areas uh, to, to find services they can commission uh, that, that than those in, in uh, more urban communities? And is there anything that, uh, that has been done centrally uh, to, to help support uh, those, those local authorities and individual schools with, with understanding you know, more creative things they can do with the money. I think the, 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 the one of the challenges will be about, if, if a school is deciding to recruit extra staff in a rural area, that will be more of a challenge than it will be in, an, in, in urban central Scotland. I think I'd, I'd have to accept that the patterns of, um, a, of school vacancies uh, tell us that that is a greater factor and the, f the, the filling of school vacancies is a more challenging factor in more rural schools than it is in more urban schools. So if a school is deciding that extra... It's not to say that it's, uh, all vacancies can be achieved within an urban setting, but it, it, it is perhaps more challenging in, in rural areas. So if a school is decided to uh, take forward a, a staff expansion approach, then they may find it difficult to, to spend the money. On other interventions, um, I, I don't think it should be um, any more challenging because a lot of the interventions that have been deployed by schools involve partnerships with third sector organisations. And I think as certainly from my experience in representing a part of rural Scotland, uh, the third sector is particularly strong in, uh, in rural Scotland and I think able to provide some of the support and assistance that schools would be looking for. Um, so it's a, uh, I, I think, uh, and certainly from our point of view, we hold regular dialogue with um, local authorities with the, uh, about the implementation of pupil equity funding. Um, we will be having, in the course of the next few weeks, uh, a range of gatherings around the country of head teachers where we will be reviewing their experience of pupil equity funding and identifying if there's any trends in that analysis that we need to take action upon. And that will be a material part of the discussion that we take forward with individual schools. Okay. Is that information you'd be able to share with the committee once on, once that process is? Yeah, if there's anything that, that emerges from that, I'd be happy to share that with the committee. Thank you.
Okay, thank you. That would be very welcome, Cabinet Secretary. Uh, Ms Mackay, if it's... Thank you. Vina, yeah. um, can you tell us how the Care Experience Children Young People Fund will be evaluated? Um, the, the fund will uh, look particularly at um, the way in which public services have uh, met the, the, the challenges and the, um, the, the, the issues that care experienced young people um, uh, face. Uh, one of the principal elements that we will be looking at will be the experience in relation to achievement of positive destinations and to identify the way in which um, a young people have progressed through the system. Um, local authorities will also be required to report on um, their particular uh, spending profile and on outcomes that are achieved for young people. And the measures that we will be looking at will be a range of nationally published data, um, uh, and some of that is contained within the um, the annual educational outcomes for Scotland's looked after children's statistics and uh, other measures such as improved school attendance and school participation, which are of course part of the framework that we look at in relation to the national improvement framework, which was the subject of consultation and which we updated Parliament about in uh, December. Thank you. Just one more. Um, in your opening statement, you, you mentioned that there's funding to create a statutory financial redress scheme for survivors of child abuse and care and to make advanced payments to elderly and ill survivors. Um, can you tell us how much has been budgeted for that? There's been an allocation of uh, £10 million made for, um, for this particular element of the, uh, within the budget. Um, I am anxious to uh, fulfil the commitments that I made to Parliament and to survivors uh, back in November, uh, sorry, October, um, where we want to move at the earliest opportunity to create a scheme that would be accessible by survivors who um, face, um, uh, you who are likely not to survive long enough for a statutory scheme to be legislated for. And the statutory scheme will take some time to, to, to go through the legislative arrangements of Parliament. Um, but I, uh, so I'm keen to, to have a scheme up and running for those who uh, have a life-limiting circumstance. Uh, we've allocated that resource. Uh, we're in dialogue with um, survivors groups about uh, how that will be taken forward and what uh, sums will be available to survivors. Um, but it's crucial that the only way I can make any payments of this type is if I use the common law powers, which can be secured through, um, sorry, if I use the common law powers that are available for me, but I need parliamentary authority to take that forward, and that arises from the passage of a Budget Act. That was my next question. So, in the absence of a successful Budget Bill, that could that money? I have no authority to spend that money, no. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Cabinet Secretary. I know there's interest in that area. Can I take you back just very slightly to, to um, the, uh, Oliver Mundell's questioning? Um, because you talked about, you used the word commissioning from head teachers, but also talked about how important the third sector is. Um, anecdotally, I've been approached by a couple of organisations who are finding it difficult to participate in pupil equity funding because the local authorities have approved supplier lists. Are you aware of that practice and do you think that would limit the, the opportunities for head teachers to be as innovative as they could be in, in terms of, that, of what they might want to use the pupil equity funding for? I think that, that my answer to that question comes back to some of the material that I covered in my answer to Jenny Gilruth earlier on. That I think in the, at the start of pupil equity funding, I think there was an awful lot more of this, you know, this is a local authority, we have our approved list, this is what you should do. I'm picking up much less of that. And for the sums of money that would be involved in some of the expenditure that would be envisaged by individual schools, it's of a level that some of those requirements of procurement wouldn't necessarily kick in to go to an approved supplier list. Um, because of the you know, just the individual sums of money that uh, may be commissioned by individual schools, uh, so I'm I, I'm aware of obviously the, the the risk, and I've 
dealt with some of these questions in the past, but I've not, I've not, I've not heard an awful lot about it in uh, the experience of pupil activity. But as I said in my answer to Mr. Mundell, um, we have the follow-up events on pupil equity funding with head teachers around the country. We did this in the spring of last year. We're doing it again this year. So we'll have the opportunity to pick up a lot more of the feedback from individual head teachers about what their experience is like. Thank you, Cabinet Secretary. I'm moving to Ms. Lamont. Okay, thank you very much. Um, just very briefly on this question of um, compensation for survivors. Are you aware that at least some survivors are very concerned that the £10 million announcement um, won't be immediate enough for some people who are elderly and, and vulnerable and do you have any proposals to bring that even further forward and do you share some concerns that the, the amount of money identified is not sufficient perhaps you can indicate how you assess need in order to come up with a figure of 10 million pounds the in, in terms of speeding up the process, uh, I have I have no means of speeding it up. I, I have no I have no parliamentary authority to make the payments because of the nature of these payments. Um, I am essentially using common law powers to um, justify the payments to individuals, which would normally require specific legislative authority to do that. And I, I, I'm, I am advised I can do that on the basis that there is legislation proposed to uh, provide for a statutory scheme. So in the current financial year up until the 1st of April, I have no means of making those payments, regrettable though that is. And I totally understand the point that Joanne Lamont makes, that, um, and I am conscious of individuals who have um, who have died while waiting for some form of scheme to put in place, and I deeply regret the fact that that has not been, we've not been able to put that in place. Um, but we are very focused on making sure it is part of this budget bill, and we, um, we've put in place the financial arrangements to make it possible. Now, on the estimating of what might be um, a reasonable sum, I, I have to say I have secured this commitment from the finance secretary as part of the budget process um, but we are we are um, we are making the best estimates we possibly can do of what resources would be available but obviously once we conclude our discussions with survivors which are currently ongoing about the eligibility arrangements the evidencing arrangements and the payment levels that may be required, which are essentially the three key components of this discussion, um, we will be establishing um, a, 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 a basis for payments, providing we have parliamentary authority to make those payments. If we find ourselves later in the financial year that we're coming up against the £10 million ceiling, but we have people who have a legitimate eligibility then I cannot see how the government um, could um, not fulfil those commitments to those individuals. So essentially what I'm saying is if we found ourselves in a situation where the £10 million um, fund that we have put in place was exhausted during the financial year, uh, I don't think the government could do anything other than make further provision for, uh, for individuals. Okay. I think that, that's very reassuring. We'd be concerned that people if they end up applying too late and the, the, yeah. the fund yeah. is closed, and you can yeah. see that would be unacceptable. Yeah. And I also think you would want to recognise this cross-party commitment to this fund working, so we wouldn't want it to get embroiled in any arguments, and broader arguments around yeah. the budget process itself. I, I think, on, think. On, on, on that point, there's been, you know, I've welcomed the, uh, the contributions that uh, a range of members of Parliament have made from across the political spectrum. I welcome that involvement. And just... If I may convene or update the committee, we are actively involved in dialogue with survivors about these three key questions about the design of the, um, the fund. And what we've found in these discussions is that you know, a lot of discussion is required to make progress on these questions. Um, but my official, I've indicated to my officials that we will reach a point where if we want to have a scheme in place for the start of the financial year, I will have to come to some conclusions about what will be 
the, the, the essential elements of, this, of the scheme. And I'd want to assure the committee that if I feel you know, my absolute commitment is there to have a, a scheme in place for the start of the financial year in April, and if that means I have to bring some con discussions to a conclusion earlier than people might wish, I will have to do that to make sure we've got a scheme in place. Thank you very much. Can I ask you just a, um, a question about Education Scotland? Um, in particular, but although it, there are issues around key bodies more generally. Forgive me, I don't have the figure with me today, but what we did identify in the committee over a period of time was in-year transfers from government to um, Education Scotland, which seemed remarkably similar for each of these years. And I wonder, you say that, um, you explain this in your response to us, that um, it's therefore common for further funding to be transferred to Education Scotland in response to changing circumstances. Can you give me an example of what those changing circumstances are that each year merited almost the same amount of money being transferred in year rather than being identified in the budget? I think what uh, the, the, the type of circumstances I suppose I would cite is that uh, the, the government looking at uh, you know, a range of uh, of priorities that may emerge within the education debate where we may need to put more emphasis on particular elements of uh, the work of um, the, the work in education and more specifically in education Scotland where we might decide to enhance investment or scale back investment but just depending on the nature of where the educational debate um, is happening we, we often face some of these challenges around some of the uh, digital literacy um, activities uh, and also in relation to um, some of the steps we've taken to as we've gone on the journey to design the national improvement framework where what we now have in place is um, is different to what we started out with a couple of years ago and that's just an, uh, essentially us discussing and consulting with relevant stakeholders what might be the best way to utilise investment resources that we have, and we end up spending them perhaps through Education Scotland. We spend the same amount every year, unplanned. Do you not think it would be better if it was a bit more strategic, that there was more rigour around the level of monies that Education Scotland would have each year? I mean, perhaps the cynic might suggest the money is held back in order to make announcements to deal with political challenges, <coughs> and I'm sure you would refute that, but can you explain to me why... I just don't understand why we know the context, mm. we know a lot of the challenges. Each year, uniquely, Education Scotland gets an in-year budget transfer that's the same as you know, two or three years before. Mm. Um, how does that fit I think with long-term planning? Is there another example in another bit of the budget where you've done the exact same well, thing? We do, well, I think, I think that this is, if I go back to my experiences as, as, um, as Finance Secretary, um, the Finance Committee quite regularly used to question me about, you know, why do you have, why don't you just, you know, you, you do uh, but, uh, but, uh, budget revision time, uh, autumn and spring budget revision times, we make a number of transfers. I talked about some of them earlier on to, to Liz Smith, where we make uh, budget transfers um, from the health service to the higher education line, for example. And they're, they're essentially part of the, the, the accumulated structure of the budget process. Now, John Lamb makes a fair point. There may be a year where we just have to say, look, let's change the structure of the budget document and process and make all the in-year transfers that we can, we know we're going to make at the outset, at the outset. But obviously that can affect the... So does that mean that you know that you're going to make these in-year transfers to well, education? For some, of, for some, for some of them... There's not changing circumstances. For some, well, well, for some of those budget lines, I'm talking about my experience as finance secretary, for some of those budget lines, like transferring from the health service for um, uh, nursing education, for example, we, we, we do know we're going to make those transfers from health to the higher education sector, and they're quite predictable. But in other circumstances, they won't be as predictable. And I'm simply making the point based on my experience as finance secretary, that there may well be um, an argument for reconfiguring some of these um, budget lines at different stages. But then, you know, parliamentary committees would have to be comfortable with those changes. So it's predictable unpredictability we've got in the education budget. In the Education Scotland budget, we know there's going to be a year transfer of the same amount of money every year, and it's explained by changing circumstances, but it's actually also 
highly predictable. I don't. I mean, I think the well, concern would be that actually what we're scrutinising is budget may not actually be what happens. And obviously, that we're interested in, in the mm. gap between the two. But can I ask you about the performance of Education Scotland? Um, we're told that um, the performance of Education Scotland has been measured um, and there's going to be a move towards regional delivery. How is that going to be assessed? And to what extent um, do um, those involved in education, teachers, support staff, f um, parents and carers, have a role in that assessment of the performance of Education Scotland? Um, well, obviously, the Education Scotland um, it has its own um, published plans that will set out the performance measures that um, are expected of Education Scotland. Uh, that's all publicly available, and uh, I, I can see you know, it's perfectly within the scope of uh, this committee to decide to look into the performance of Education Scotland and to uh, e examine its performance against its corporate plan or its key performance indicators. And part of what um, I've asked the, uh, the, the, the Chief Executive of Education Scotland to do is to ensure that the organisation is um, much more um, accessible to a range of different interested stakeholders around the country. That's why it's got such a key role to play in the regional collaboratives, which are crucial to working uh, to, to fulfil the recommendation of the OECD about encouraging more collaboration within the education system. So Education Scotland will be working with local authorities and individual schools to create the culture of improvement that uh, we want to see within education in Scotland. And fundamentally, uh, the performance of the organisation uh, will be judged against um, how it performs on, its, uh, on, on, on the, the key performance indicators that are contained within its plans. But there is, is there a role for education staff, parents and carers in feeding into that process? Well, I'll give you an example of where there may be a, a, a gap in, in perception. One of the things that Education Scotland argued very strongly when they came in front of the committee that evidence of their improvement was they were employing more staff. Now it has if you went into any school and asked them, how do we address the problems you're facing, whether you're a sport member of sports staff or a teacher, to what extent do you think having more staff working for Education Scotland is a good thing or a bad thing? I'm not sure if they would think that was the best use of money. And I just wonder whether there is a role for the groups I've identified in informing your view or our view of the benefits or the effectiveness of Education Scotland. Of, of course, and, and, I, uh, and I listen very carefully to um, feedback within the education sector on a whole manner of different issues and uh, the performance of Education Scotland would be one of those issues that I look carefully at. Um, we, as the committee will be aware, uh, I've established the um, Scottish Education Council, which enables me to um, bring together a whole range of interested parties within Scottish education to, um, to focus on common priorities. And within that, we discuss um, the performance of different organisations and performance of key parts of the education system in meeting the needs of young people in Scotland. Okay. And last, last question. I wonder if you can just um, outline um, how your strategic priorities are reflected in the different settlements for different public um, agencies involved in education. So we changed the budget to Education Scotland. I note that SQA is stable in cash terms. So I presume that means there's a reduction in its budget, while Skills Development Scotland has an increase of 9.1% in real terms. I wonder if you could just outline why you've decided to make the allocation priorities in the way you have done. Certainly. Obviously, the, um, as Jan Lamont correctly indicates, um, you know, the SQA is, um, is at a mature point in its delivery of um, the, uh, its requirements. And my judgment was that the resources were appropriate and adequate for 
Um, sorry, the sorry to interrupt you, but that mature point, was that identified by SQA? Did they say they were at that mature point? Was that a decision that I think they, I think the SQA, I think the S, um, but that's my judgment, but the SQA, I think, would probably would also corroborate that point in terms of being at a mature point in the development of their activity. Education Scotland has, I've asked Education Scotland to do um, a range of, uh, to, to make a range of interventions uh, and to build up capacity within the education system. I am, I've made no secret of the fact that I think there's been a diminution of the um, central capacity for improvement within our education system. I don't mean that just in terms of central government, I mean cent, cent, you know, a common area for improvement within our education system. Uh, and, I, and I want Education Scotland to make a contribution to that, which is why there has been an increase in resources there. And in relation to Skills Development Scotland, um, the government is committed to further expansion of the Modern Apprenticeship Programme, so we're putting in the additional resources that are required to support the continued expansion of the Modern Apprenticeship Programme as we make further steps towards the achievement of 30,000 Modern Apprenticeship starts by 2021. And will some of that money be used to address some of the inequities within the Modern Apprenticeship Scheme, where people with um, additional support needs, disabled people, um, disproportionately women, um, and, and other groups have been have had less access to these modern apprenticeships? I would like to see that being the case, yes. So there's something, there is something in place to do well, that? The, 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 um, the, 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 the letter of guidance that we will... Um, issue to Skills Development Scotland will make provision for the type of requirements that John Lamont raised with me. Thank you. Uh, Ms Corrath, you wanted to ask? Um, John Lamont uh, highlighted Education Scotland and spoke about teachers in the schools perhaps not seeing, I suppose, the advantages of, of the work of the organisation. And, you know, from personal experience, I was a secondee in Education Scotland. There is an opportunity perhaps to look at the secondee model, which empowers teachers to go into the organisation and to take that learning back into schools as well. Um, and I know, obviously, there's an extra £2.5 million pounds increase going into the budget uh, for Education Scotland specifically. You know, it says uh, in today's evidence, resources will be focused on tackling the equity and excellence agenda. And we're looking towards these regional collaboratives. Is there an opportunity, therefore, to look at that secondee model or perhaps at how we empower you know, classroom teachers to learn from that expertise at Education Scotland to, to get a breadth of learning there so it's not you know, a division between them and us in the school and the organisation centrally? Definitely. And that's, uh, I, I'm, I'm very keen on that model being the case. I think there's a... Um, is a, a really good development that um, Education Scotland takes forward of um, some staff's economists, an example that uh, Jenny Goldruth puts to me. There's also um, the associate assessor opportunities where practising teachers are part of the inspection um, uh, teams that are taken forward by Education Scotland. And having spoken to some of those associate assessors, they find that some of the best professional learning they undertake because they are seeing educational practice in other settings that they can then learn from and consider that's relevant to their own educational practice within their own schools. So I'm very keen to encourage what I would describe as a more fluid model where individuals may be involved in secondments um, uh, to enable that uh, the development of professional capacity to take place. Thank you. Mr Greer? Deputy First Minister, I'd like to turn to the local government settlement for a moment. Um, do you believe that local authority spending on education will increase, decrease or stay roughly the same in this coming financial year? Yeah, I would imagine it will increase. You take out the um, various specific um, funding programmes. Um, core spending on education has obviously um, decreased significantly over the, the last decades. Wider financial uh, pressures resulted in decreases across spending areas. The government's introduced a number of specific funds to tackle specific areas, but they're not core funding and they're not meant as a replacement for the funds that have been lost through core funding. Do you acknowledge that and do you acknowledge that core funding on education is likely to decrease? I suppose what I, what, what I particularly look at is what's the experience in relation to um, funding as a whole uh, within education and what um, the, the most recent information that um, I have available to me shows in 
20, 16, 17, 17, 18, and in 18, 19, we're all predicting, sorry, either delivered or predict an increase in education spending by local authorities. And uh, so I think that, that gives me confidence that local authorities are putting the necessary priority um, onto education investment uh, within schools and supporting that process. Is the, the increase that, uh, that you're looking at there, if that excludes, if, if we are to exclude the uh, money that is for specific funds that can only be spent for those specific purposes, if we go back to the core funding that they are allowed to allocate as they see fit, is that increasing? I don't believe it did. Well, I, th I think we, 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 we then, I think, get into some of the, uh, I think, uh, yeah, that's why I answered the question, the last question, the way that I did, that I'm interested in what's the overall position looking like, because that's what schools feel when they experience the spending. You know, at school level spending um, in 16-17 was, um, was a one, there was a 1.3 per cent increase uh, compared to 14-15. And um, you know, so we've got that, we're seeing that improvement in education expenditure at local level and I think that's that's the the pattern that I welcome uh, to make sure that the education is properly supported at local level if we take the the staff for example that have been brought on teaching staff that have been brought on through the the attainment funds I think it's just short of a, a thousand something 900 ish um, teaching staff uh, who've been brought on those staff are not, by the requirements of uh, those funds and what they can and cannot be spent on, those staff are not a replacement for core classroom teachers who have been cut in previous years. Do you understand the concern from teaching staff, from schools, from parents and from pupils that they are, their core capacity is being reduced, that while these staff are very welcome and uh, make a, a significant contribution, they are not a replacement for classroom teachers, for support staff who have been lost from cuts to core budgets over the last few years? Well, we've seen, um, you know, we've seen teacher numbers rising. You know, so teacher numbers are now up at 51,959 in the last census, which was 447 up on the previous year. And indeed, since the teachers who've been recruited using these specific funds for these specific purposes, though, does it yeah, not? Yeah, and, that's, and, and I, suppose, I, I suppose this is where I'm trying to, to, to respond to Mr Gear's questions. What we are trying to do is to make sure the school system is well resourced and supported. And we're now seeing a rising number of teachers, more teachers than at any time since 2010. Now, I appreciate there's been... Um, and Mr Greer will appreciate this, uh, there's been challenges in the public finances. Um, what we're trying to do is to make sure that we, within the very uh, constrained public finances, do all that we possibly can do to strengthen the resources available within education. And we're now seeing our teacher numbers up at nearly 52,000 as a consequence. Numbers, because you yourself have made very clear the case. In fact, when when there were questions over what local authorities could or could not spend this money on, you're very clear that these attainment funds are not a replacement for core but, funding. So, therefore, can you really count a teacher who has been recruited under attainment funding? It, that number is simply being used to mask the fact that the number of core classroom teaching staff has reduced. Because, as you said yourself, these staff are being recruited under these. Uh, ring-fenced funds are not replacements for or equivalents to classroom staff who have been cut. Out, if we took out the teachers that are funded by these mechanisms, we would still have an increase in the number of teachers. So they are additional. So if we, if we took them out, we'd still have an increase in the number of teachers. So if we took them out for last year, for example, if we took the, uh, out of the 447, um, th if we took out the teachers that have been recruited under the PEF and Tame Scotland Fund, the increase in teacher numbers would have been 151. That's so, these, so these teachers are additional to those yeah, to the other coming in. The, po the point still stands, though, because that's, again, that's over a single year. Obviously, over the last decade, we've lost thousands of, of teaching staff. 
And the point still stands that the government has repeatedly used the higher number to talk about the increase in the number of teaching staff with, without acknowledging the fact that the overwhelming majority of these additional staff, including over this last year, have been recruited using these ring-fenced funds for specific purposes and are therefore not replacements to the core teaching staff who have been lost over the last decade. Well, but, you know, I've acknowledged the challenges in the public finances that the government has had to face up to, but what I'm saying is that in each year since 2000 and... Um, probably 2013, I would think. I don't have the full list the numbers in front of me. Um, a, yes, a, I think since 2013 we've seen year-on-year -year increases in the number of teachers um, and in the last year and in the previous year we saw, even if we took out of the equation the teachers funded by PEF and the Attainment Scotland funding, we would have had an increase in teacher numbers in both last year and the year before. I think we'll continue to revisit this throughout budget negotiations, I'm sure. Thank you, Camille. Um, uh, Ms. Lamont. Yeah, I just, mm -hmm. um, one last question for me. Um, I wonder, uh, the EIS has expressed concerns about investment in, in education and in teachers' pay. How will the teachers' pay settlement and any backdated pay be funded from these budget proposals? And I understand you've made a further offer in the last period. So presumably even more money has to be found. Can you direct us to where that is in the budget? These, um, uh, we're obviously still continuing with discussions and dialogue with the teaching trade unions to try to get to a solution. Uh, the government has uh, committed itself to provide additional resources to that effect. Uh, and the finance secretary has given a commitment to uh, ensure that is the case, and that's what the government will fulfil through the negotiations. The but we're obviously not complete. Where's the money coming from to well, make that commitment? The government will have to. I, the, the government will put in place the mechanisms to enable us to to fund those resources. I already required. said earlier that you couldn't fund a compensation scheme of ten million pounds because you needed budget authority. Are you now saying that in terms of teacher settlement, you will find the money? You've made the commitment, but you're not able to tell us where it's going to come from. There's two very different points here, that, and, I, and this is a point that I have to make to Joanne Lamont so she, she clearly understands it. Um, I have no legislative authority to spend on the £10 million. It's not a case of availability of money. I have no legislative... And I, and I, I, and I'm, I have to labour this point with the committee. I cannot make those payments if this budget bill does not pass. So that's, that. so that's so that's so we so we clearly understand right, that point. Okay. And then on so where is the money coming from? But, not only to fund the, the pay settlement and back pay, but this uh, this offer we're now told you have said there's a commitment. Is well, a commitment out with the budget process? It, the, the resources would be in addition to the local government settlement that is proposed within this budget, and we're, the government and the government um, will uh, put in place those resources. So would it come from within the education budget? A, that's something that uh, we will be discussing on an ongoing basis, but um, uh, the uh, resources would be additional to the local government settlement. And I'm working the assumption you must already have had this discussion if you're making an enhanced offer. So uh, well, I think the, it would the, be helpful to the committee to know whether the, the, the pay settlement is going to come out of the education budget, because that then changes our consideration mm. of the, um, the, the, the provisions for education within the budget process. Or is it coming from somewhere else? Where is it coming from? Well, we're obviously in um, a continuing uh, negotiation with the teaching trade unions, which is not yet concluded. And obviously, once that is concluded, um, we will make the financial provision for these arrangements. But you must, you must surely know where that money is going to come well, from. You are... can't go to a negotiating table um, with an offer if you've not at least got a wee hint for yourselves where well, the money is going to come from. Uh, Th th those are discussions the finance secretary and I um, have had, but it's, have you sought reassurances um, that the money won't come out of the current education budget? Yes. So it won't come from the education yes. budget. Okay. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Um, I think that concludes questions from uh, the committee this morning. Can I thank you, Ca Cabinet Secretary, for your attendance and attendance of your officials?
Um, before we finish, I'd like to put on record that we did receive apologies from Gordon MacDonald um, for today's committee. Um, that concludes public session for this week and we will continue our evidence and standardised assessments next week and I now suspend before we move into private session. Thank you.